So it's February 25th, 2015. I'm at the Kubernetes gathering. So this is where all the Kubernetes contributors come together and help define and push Kubernetes forward. And then we go upstairs, the very first Kubernetes meetup. And I got the first speaking slot. I got my laptop on the podium. It's VMware Fusion this time. I launched the cluster. And the first set of machines come up. I type the first command to connect to the cluster to show Kubernetes off. And I can literally hear the music stop. My demo breaks. I'm like a deer in headlights. There's 10 minutes left. I look over and I see Brian Grant and Clayton Coleman in the audience. See, I respect these two. They're the people who taught me what distributed systems look like. These are the folks that helped review my pull request when I was just an imposter in the Kubernetes community. There's only eight minutes to go. Clocks keep tipping, ticking. I can't figure out what's wrong. Kid is waving me off the stage because there's now only four minutes to go. I do like any respectable presenter would do. I look over and pretend I didn't see him. <laughs> <laughs> there's three minutes left now. The demo's still broken. I look out to the audience and I ask, would you guys like me to finish the demo? So the crowd says yes. I pick up the pace now. I shut everything down, and Brian Grant and Clayton Coleman are leaning forward. See, I don't want to let them down. The cluster comes back up. I register the first three nodes. So this is before Kubernetes had auto node registration. So you had to do it by hand. The nodes are connected. And then I run kubectfg, get nodes and nothing shows up. And I would do this repeatedly, stalling for time. The audience is wondering why I'm not using the watch command. <laughs> <laughs> and then somehow, a node shows up, and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, wait till they see the rest of the demo. <laughs> I execute a few more keystrokes, and everything is smooth at this point. Everything's working now, just as I had planned it. One more keystroke, and the demo is finished. I look out in the audience, and I say, thank you. And the thing that was most important about that day is that all the contributors to Kubernetes were sitting there, and even though my demo was broken, they were on my side. They wanted me to succeed. We worked at different companies, and then they were patient with me while I struggled and learned from my mistakes to resolve the issue. And then, when everything started working, they also celebrated with me and joined me in the victory. That day would define how Kubernetes community would gather and support each other going forward. Time would go by. And we have a new gathering. It will go by a different name. This time, we will call it KubeCon. I want to give a shout out to Patrick Riley and Joseph Jacks for coming up the name, and they even did the little logo. And the first KubeCon only had about 500 people, so that's about this side. <laughs> <laughs> and then we will go from 500 to now, I heard 12,000 people here at KubeCon. And the funny thing is, I almost missed it. See, around 2017, I was getting tired of this. How many times can we talk about pods coming up? <laughs> if someone shows me one more canary demo, I'm going to scream. <laughs> <laughs> We're in London now, and I'm given the keynote. I'm not quite sure what I said, but I'm pretty sure it sounds similar to the first one. I walk off stage, and Joe Beta is eager to meet me at the floor. Something about YAML versus JSON, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we all walk out to the sponsor area, and we're in what they call the hallway track. 
So you step back and you form this circle. Joe Betis to my left, and a bunch of new people that I had the pleasure of meeting. And when you're in the hallway track, sometimes new people show up. And in this case, a new person did show up. And then what you do is you pivot to make room for them so that they know that they're welcome, just like that first KubeCon event in San Francisco. He would join the circle, and he would ready himself for a question. See, I was ready. I'm like three years into this Kubernetes thing. You can ask me anything. Etcd, Kubit, Scheduler, I got it. And we would go, and he had a tremble in his voice. He said, "Kelsey, I have a question for you. What is it like being the only black person in the room?" Now I'm stunned because I wasn't ready for that one. See, the thing is, I'm different at most conferences, but I don't actually experience it. I actually get the benefit of the doubt. People look at me and say, "Oh, it's Kelsey Hightower. He probably knows what he's talking about." I get preferential treatment. And in the midst of that question, I thought back to a speaker dinner that I was at, not KubeCon. But we were at the bottom of the staircase, looking up. See, the speaker dinner was up, maybe nine, ten flights of stairs, and one of our speakers was in a wheelchair. And all she wanted to do was go and attend the speaker dinner with everyone else. And people at the dinner offered to pick her up out of the chair and carry her up the stairs, but that's not what she wanted. All she wanted to do was participate, just like everyone else. See what happened? No one planned for anyone in the wheelchair to be a speaker at the conference. So when they picked the restaurant, that was not top of mind. That's what it's like when you're different at a conference, and no one knows who you are. You tend to be forgotten about. So I'm not sure what answer that I gave him, but I understood what he was asking. He would then go on to say, "I never thought I needed someone to look up to, until I saw you on YouTube. You were on stage giving this keynote, and this is the first time someone that looks like me was leading such an advanced set of technologies." Now at this point, I'm starting to tear up a little bit. You know, allergies. <laughs> and I look over. And Joe Bate is tearing up too. He must also have allergies. <laughs> and at that point, we realized that this conference isn't about technology. It's part of the job. It's part of the tool sets we use. But the more important part is the human beings that we're doing this for. And then he would do one more thing. He would bring his son from behind him. See, we didn't notice the young fella. And he would bring his son in front and say, "Hey, I brought my son with me, and I wanted my son to have a chance to meet you. I wanted to show him that not only are we allowed to attend the conference, we can also lead." And at that moment, I never had a chance to thank him for that. But the one thing that he did for me was he reminded me of what my purpose was. See, I'm not just talking to you all; I'm talking through the screen. I'm talking to the person that may be on the other side of this whole thing, being motivated to attend for the very first time. They're going to find that courage to say, "You know what? I can do that too." And what's beautiful about that is when they do muster the courage up to come and show up, we support them and we make them feel welcome. So they come back, they bring someone with them. That's what KubeCon is all about. Throughout the years, someone will always tell me, "It's not a race; it's a marathon." And I've never been able to put that into any sort of context before. What does that even mean? If you pay attention to the sports world, there's what's considered to be the greatest marathon runner of our time, Elliot Kipchoge. He holds the world record for the marathon. He's won so many races; he has almost every Every accolade you can think of for a marathon runner, except for one. Experts believe that no human could run 26.2 miles in under two hours. Isn't possible. 
In all of these races, people run as fast as they can. You've got to remember, in the race, it's a zero-sum game. The goal is there's only one winner. You run faster than everyone else, and you win. But he wanted to run under two hours. So guess what? There's a little bit of technology involved, if you care about it. Nike even made special shoes for anyone that wanted to endeavor to run 26.2 miles in under two hours. The latest technology. There's even a pace car that runs and drives in front, and it projects lasers on the pavement, creating this nice formation on the pavement to be filled by humans. See, technology alone wasn't going to get it. The problem is, as you're running, you can hit and draft and slow down. So you would need other runners in front, and they would take five of the best runners, and they would run and create this inverted V in front of him. And there would be two runners behind him, creating the perfect running conditions to push him further and faster than he ever could. See, these are the pace setters. There would be 41 in total, because guess what? That one group could never finish the race and run that fast. So what they would do is they would orchestrate The seven would take turns. Every step of the way, you would have a new group come in with fresh legs and remind him of what the actual goal is. We have to do this under two hours. And they would swap out and not skip a beat. And then he would continue to move forward. One hour, 59 minutes later, he crosses the finish line. In this case, there was nothing to win because this is not an official marathon. It's not in the rule books to have a group of runners collaborate. But guess what? They still won because the mission was actually defining what the new human boundaries were and pushing the whole thing forward. When I look back over time, all of us are just pace setters. None of us are the actual marathon runner. The marathon here is what can we do with these ideas and with these tools. You're just pace setters. It's not about where you rank on the contribution list. It's not about how big your sponsorship is. You do not run yourself into the ground. You're going to burn out. You orchestrate. You come in, you help set the pace, and it's okay to step aside for a moment and make room for the next person to push the thing forward. And even when you're standing on the sidelines, you can always remember that you did your part to move the whole project forward And no matter what, you will always be a part of history, no matter how big or how small your contribution was. We're just pace setters. There's a much bigger vision. And if you remember one thing out of this, it's not a race if we're all on the same team. Thank you.